Welcome back, um, you guys that were on break that go to college. College is a good thing. We should go to school. Um, I went to college once. I didn't go to class much, but I went to college. Pre-salvation. It's pre-salvation. If those of you guys that were at church this morning, um, the they had the healed service this morning, which was obviously incredible. Um, hopefully you guys got to be a part of that. If not, I would highly encourage you on Tuesday and Wednesday this week to come see Gustavo Pius. Um, his anointing and just being in an atmosphere where you see the power of God at that level will definitely encourage you and it will align with what we're going to communicate tonight, um, which is the third phase of the ghost. We're talking about the ghost. So the, the first night we were, we were going to show you guys a movie clip, but the movie was from the 90s and you guys were all dead whenever that was. The only me and the, like Amanda was alive and Dustin was alive. Everybody else was dead. Okay. I'm going to preach, but first I'm going to move this. Yeah, that's right. CrossFit 2017. That's why you should stay fit. The physical is connected to the spiritual. So Jesus came to bring a kingdom, okay, to bring the kingdom of heaven. The number one reason that Jesus died was not so that you could go to heaven, because the Greek word for salvation to means to make whole, okay, but he died, his, his, his blood wiped your sins clean so that he could send the Holy Spirit and so that the Holy Spirit could reside on the inside of you and you could come back to your original state. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, God made this covenant with them. He said, take rulership, take dominion, multiply, be fruitful, and I am going to give you the power to do that as long as the woman doesn't screw it up. Gentlemen, you were supposed to laugh because now all the... I'm just kidding. Ladies, I'm just kidding, okay? Take dominion, be fruitful, okay, and multiply, and as long as you obey, you will have my authority and my dominion here on earth. So when Jesus died and went to the cross, when Jesus was here, he was the king of earth, but really Jesus is the king of heaven, so he was like, I'm going to come for a little while. I'm going to show you God in the flesh. It's going to be super cool. I'm going to take authority and power over everything, show you how you need to live. But I am going back to heaven because while I'm here, I'm occupying the fullness of the Holy Spirit because the fullness of the Holy Spirit was in him and only him. So he had to die, go back to heaven because in Revelation 1.6, it says you were called to be kings here on earth. So when he died and went to heaven, he sent the promise, which was the Holy Spirit. So now you were back to your original state whenever you receive your salvation, the Holy Spirit comes in you, and whenever you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it comes upon you. You are now back in your original state, oneness with God created to dominate, to take dominion, rulership, and authority in this life. Everybody tracking with me? Matthew 6.33, I know you guys haven't heard this scripture before, but seek intimacy first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things will, shall be added unto you. The Greek word for seek means to seek intimacy. The very first thing you need to seek is intimacy, intimacy which we talked about for a month. Number two, okay, the kingdom and this Greek word, we need a Greek scholar, Brazilian or Brazilian, or Brazilian, or something like that. A kingdom realm in which a king sovereignly is in control or rulership. You have to seek the kingdom. You're going to have to understand. If you're going to function in the power that the Holy Spirit has given you, you are going to have to study the kingdom of heaven, get it in you, and understand the rulership and the authority that you have in this earth. Why is it intimacy first? Because without... Intimacy, there can be no kingdom because kingdoms are established through covenant relationship. They have to have a king. A king has to have rulership. He has to have people to have dominion over. He needs a domain, but he needs human. That's how he needs humans. That's how he establishes 
his kingdom, a king domain. The king has rulership over the domain. Who is in the domain? The humans are in the domain. So how does Jesus still become king of the earth? He does it by sending the Holy Spirit and allowing us to rule and take dominion and authority here. You have to seek this kingdom. You have to know it. You have to study it. You have to get it in you. Mark 4.24 says that the measure that you study this and get it in you and apply it to your life is the measure that you will get it back. That's what Mark 4.24 says. So if you take no time to go back and study this, you will always lack the knowledge of the kingdom of heaven and the revelation of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your life. You will not fulfill the call of God on your life without understanding the power that you have in the Holy Spirit. Everybody understand that? Am I, is there a, uh, whatchamacallit? Am I a little fuzzy in the microphone? No, no? It sounds like I'm getting a thing back there and we should fire somebody. There's like a little, is that what we do? Yep. The very first covenant with man was to take dominion and rulership. Matthew 6.10 says this, And your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the third commission. So Jesus gave you three. God gave you three. Disciple humans. Just disciple people. Transfer disciplines. You can't transfer a weak relationship with God. Transfer your disciplines. Go into the hedges and the highways and compel people in so that God's kingdom may be full. Oh, and FYI, I need you to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. When Jesus came, he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He brought the kingdom of heaven. How does he plant the kingdom of heaven? He is now planting the kingdom of heaven through us. The kingdom of heaven is in you by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how he's going to plant his kingdom here on earth, which is what we are going to talk about tonight. The word of God said to Joshua, everywhere you set foot, you will gain ground. You will take dominion everywhere you go. Everywhere you set foot, you will gain, gain ground for the kingdom of heaven. This is what the Holy Spirit does in your life. In your domain where God has called you, whether it is to be a student or you are a young adult and you are a, an, an, an accountant or you want to be a doctor, God wants to put his super on your natural because a lot of people get the vocation right and we can apply principles inside of the kingdom and we can do them with excellence and we, we, we can become great in the world but that does not mean we're going to make impact. God wants to put his super on your natural so as you're becoming great at your vocation or your purpose or what you're called to do you are making an impact for the kingdom. This is different than just being a great soccer coach or being great at business or being a great worship leader like you can work in vocational ministry and there be no super on your natural we have seen that in the church in america today first corinthians 420 says 420 says this for the kingdom of god is not in word but in power what is the kingdom of god what is the kingdom of heaven it is not about talk it is not about what i'm doing with you right now this is the least part of how Jesus spent his days communicating to the masses. He spent the majority of the time discipling his disciples, teaching them how to plant the kingdom of heaven, how to bring his rulership and his authority and his dominion. He took them with him whenever he laid hands on the sick and watched people recovered. They watched him produce the miracles of heaven. They watched him bring heaven to earth everywhere that he went. This was the majority of the time that Jesus spent his ministry. It was not preaching to the masses. Jesus didn't establish a religion. He established a kingdom, and kingdoms are built on covenant relationship. You are called to be co-heirs with Christ. That means co-kings. So Jesus came. Whenever he came, he occupied the Holy Spirit, as I told you earlier, but he wants you to be co-kings here on earth. So he had to die on the cross, go back to heaven, and send you the Holy Spirit, the governor of heaven, to give you the power and the authority to get it done here on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. God does not want you to live with sickness and disease and anxiety and fear and all these things that make you think about you. He wants you free of those things so that you can focus on loving the people around you and, and bringing the 
kingdom of God. I'm bringing power. Why did Jesus lay hands on people and watch them recover? And why did he never deny anybody healing? Because salvation means to make you whole. It means to repair you, to mend you back to your original state. This is what the Greek word for salvation means. So this is, this is what Jesus brought whenever he brought salvation. He brought you back to your original state. Now, you, your job, your calling, your mission is to do the same. Bring heaven to earth. Go into the hedges and the highways and to compel people in to fill my house. And then disciple people because without prayer and fasting and without the word of God, without these spiritual disciplines, the kingdom will not continue to grow. Pray in the spirit constantly because it builds you up on your most holy faith. Let's just talk about what that really means. It makes your faith whole. Nothing broken, nothing lacking, nothing missing. How do you get whole faith? Through your prayer, through praying in the Spirit, through prayer, through prayer, through prayer without ceasing, so that you're constantly able to see into the unseen world, which we will talk about. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is super important. Um, And if you have never prayed in tongues, I, I... some people introduced me to the baptism of the Holy Spirit right after I got saved. Um, and they kind of followed me around and they were trying to they were trying to get me to pray in tongues and I wanted to punch them in the face because that's how I rolled. I was like, you guys are dorks. I don't want to talk to you about your baptism of the Holy Spirit or your Holy Spirit that you talk about. It was hard enough to get me to the altar. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what gives you traction inside of the kingdom. It gives you understanding. It allows you to see into the unseen. It gives you supernatural wisdom, revelation, knowledge, and understanding. The, the text on the page is useless until we get it into our hearts and we begin to live it out. We can't live it out without the power of the Holy Spirit because it's difficult and it's hard. There's a world that is opposed to you, that is opposing the kingdom of heaven. There's a world that hates you because Its culture, its way of doing things, it's completely opposite to the culture's way of doing things. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is super important, but more important than that is that the Holy Spirit has who? Has you, all of you. It wants to dominate you. Being led by the Holy Spirit is the hardest thing I told you guys last week that I have done inside of this Christian walk. I ran to an altar in front of 4,000 people. That was difficult, okay? But hearing a voice from a person that I could not see and listening to that and executing was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do inside of the kingdom. The ghost, the Holy Spirit, we call him the ghost. Holy ghost, I'm old school. The ghost is a bridge between heaven and earth. John 15, 19 says this, if you were of the world, the world would love its If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world is going to hate you. The world is not led by the Holy Spirit. In fact, it hates everything that the Holy Spirit is about. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the only thing that has authority and dominion over the world. God gave Satan the world. What did Satan do? Satan set up a culture. What's a culture? It's just a way of doing things. Goofy way of doing things. Just a goofy way of doing things. This is how you become successful in the world. You focus on the world. You read how to win friends and influence people, like goofy books that sound good, but they're not really God. The culture of the world is completely contrary to the culture of the kingdom. The kingdom of the culture is paradoxical in nature. Odd. It's going to be odd to us. The world says seek greatness. The kingdom says seek humility. The world says learn how to be a leader. But what did Jesus do? He produced followers. One says increase. The other says decrease. One says seek the world and it will add to you. The other says, seek the kingdom, and everything will be added unto you. One says, look out for your own. The other says, consider others. 
The world says be your best. The kingdom says do your best. The world says to consider how great you are. The kingdom says consider others better than yourself. The world says become much here on earth. And the kingdom says that the one that becomes the least, the servant of all, will be the greatest. The world says that you are responsible for the result. The word of God says that the lot is cast in the lap, but the weight of every decision is for, from the Lord. You are responsible for the process. You are not responsible for the result. You are responsible to obey and then hand the result over to God, whatever it may be. Is everybody tracking with me? The culture of the kingdom is so much different than the culture of the world. Why does the world hate you? Because you have access to the most powerful thing in the world, and it will dominate everything about the kingdom of the world if you allow it to. But one of my favorite quotes, I think it's profound because I came up with it, but just nobody else is really, nobody else is really gravitating to it, Colton. But we don't always access what we have access to. Fasting is one of the most powerful things you can do, but people in the kingdom don't, they don't fast. So strongholds aren't, we don't see strongholds broken. People don't pray at any type of level that matters. So they live kind of halfway in the world and halfway in the kingdom. But if you're half in this way and half in this way, you just kind of slowly gravitate back to the world. You've got to be all in if you're going to be in the kingdom. And then you have to follow the paradoxical laws that are inside the kingdom that we're not trying to be leaders. We're trying to be followers of Christ. If that makes me a leader, that's great. I'm not responsible for the result. I'm responsible for the process. You tracking with me, Butler? Okay. Is everybody tracking with me? The kingdom of God is unseen. The Holy Spirit, in essence, is the bridge that allows you to see the unseen here on earth. There is an unseen world. God said, I haven't given you the spirit of fear. Why? Because fear is spiritual. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Spirit. What are those? Those are... A spirit of righteousness, a spirit of peace, a spirit of joy. That is contrary to fear and anxiety. So the world is trying to put fear and anxiety and oppression and sickness and disease on you. Why? Because whenever you're, you, are, you have sickness, you have disease, you have oppression, you have depression, you are focused on who? It makes you narcissistic. I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to be mean because I get it, I have been there. <laughs> But that's why Jesus died on the cross, was to heal you of your sickness, of your di disease, of your oppression, of your depression, to free you of everything so that you can walk freely focused on who? Not you, but on the people around you so that you can love, so that you can establish God's kingdom. You can't do that if you have a narcissistic mindset, if you're always focused on what you're dealing with. And I understand there's a time, there's a process. There's a process that we have to go through where we have to, we're, we're dealing with anxiety. And sometimes we don't get drive-through breakthrough. I didn't say that, Joyce Meyer did, but super good. Okay, sometimes we don't get drive-through breakthrough. Sometimes we have to go through the process. Because if every time we just prayed, it was just like magic choice, we, we would never have to get into the word and really stand on it and really declare it. It's time and patience that builds the faith-filled life. We can't bypass patience and perseverance and live a faith-filled life. Some of these things take time. Some of these things that, are, that look like such a great obstacle are going to become your greatest blessing. They're going to become your greatest opportunity. Where you are weak, God will make you strong. Typically, you will minister in the areas that you are attacked the hardest, and you have an unseen enemy that knows this. So whenever you try to process why you have been attacked so hard in that area, you will begin to see your calling. Luke 10, 19, sorry, the Holy Spirit is a bridge that allows you access to the unseen inside of this world. Luke 10, 19 says, behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. This authority and this power is real. Men, religious churches of our day, they, they, 
they bulk at this because they operate in false humility. Well, I can't really see myself to have the same power and same authority as God. It's not about you. Don't worry. If you're going to prostitute the gifts of God, you will never see that power and authority because God's not trying to share his glory. But if you will humble yourself and you will submit to the word of God, if you will come under the word of God, broken with humility, willing to follow, you will have the authority and the power of the word of God. You will trample all over the serpent and all over the world and all over the culture that Satan set up here. That's all Satan did. He can't kill you. He can't, if he would punch, he would punch you in the face if he could. <laughs> like he would, because he, he's, he's, he's a punk. He can't. He would have killed you, Simone. Like he, he would have already killed you by now if he could. He can't hurt you. All he can get you to do is buy into a culture and a system and a way and a process that is contrary to the kingdom of God. And in that, he will destroy you through distraction. Point number two, faith brings you what is yours by the power of the Holy Spirit. What is faith? The evidence and substance of something that we cannot see. But there's substance to it, even though we can't see it. It's in the invisible. So how do we see it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit allows you to see into the unseen. You guys have to grasp this. Because we talk about faith all the time, but people don't grasp it. Uh, faith, you got to have more faith. And then we start putting our faith in our own faith, and it's like, how do I muster up more faith? Whoa. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> faith isn't magical. That's not how it works. Faith is built through prayer and through a- accessing the Holy Spirit, through accessing the unseen. In 2 Kings six fifteen through 17, the prophet Elisha attendant saw something in the visible realm that overwhelmed him. The Syrian army encircling their city with horses and chariots. And he said, alas, my master, he said, what shall we do? And Elisha, though, was not shaken. He saw a deeper reality in the unseen realm. He said, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Elisha then prayed and said, O Lord, I pray, open my eyes. Oh, I'm sorry, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fires all around Elisha. There is an unseen world. You have unseen angels and protection that you can't see. This world that we live in doesn't make sense because Romans 4.17 says that we call those things that are not as though we are, and I am declaring the word of God. But Alex, I can't see my words. (laughs) But they are establishing and accomplishing everything everything that they were sent out to do. God, I thank you that I am the head and not the tail, that I am above only and not beneath, that I am more than an overcomer, that I am more than a conqueror. God, I thank you that you are my fortress, my stronghold, that you actually are building a fortress around me, that you are my stronghold, that you are my refuge, that you are my helper in time of need, but I cannot see you. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, I can see in the unseen that you're building a hedge of protection and a fortress around me, and I will be the head and not the tail and above only and not beneath. Because this is simply what the Word of God says, that he will perfect everything that concerns you. I am speaking that into existence now, and it is going to produce something, but I can't see the words. But the substance and the evidence of it is that it will come to pass. He will work on the good of your behalf, because that's what the Word of God says. So I confess it every day over myself, over my kids, over my wife, over my family, because I know that God is going to work on the good of their behalf. Why? Because I'm scared that he won't know, because I want my child to hear it so he knows all the days of his life that God is going to work on the good of his behalf. That he is not looking at the visible, the things in the world, but he can see into the unseen that there is a greater vision, a greater calling on your life than what you're going through right now. During finals week, you will get super worried about a test and, and what the result's going to be. And I know that that's super important. Now, I didn't worry about a lot of tests back in my day. I thank God for you guys that do and work hard in school. I wish that I would have worked harder. I had a conversation with my wife today. I found out she was a big dork. She was like, I made my first B, like my junior year of college or something. I was like, I did not know you were that dorky. Like I knew... On some level, I was like, the, my first being in college, like, we threw a keg party. Like, I was super unsaved, and I was like, let's go. Like, above average, first, first time, I made a 14 my ACT, so I'm like, first time in my life, above average, let's go. 
kill, I killed racquetball. And if I wouldn't have had six absences, I probably would have made an A. I'm just kidding. I made a B in something else besides racquetball. Forgot where we're at. Um, faith comes by hearing, and it is built by prayer. That's why we talk about the widow, the widow of persistent prayer. And Jesus said, well, I see faith whenever I come back to earth. Well, I see faith like this persistent widow who has prayed with persistence through everything and stood on the word of God, even whenever it tarried, even whenever I didn't see it come to pass straight away, because you can't bypass patience and perseverance on your way to a faith-filled life. So faith comes by hearing. It's not built by hearing. It just comes by hearing. This is where the kingdom of God gets confused. This is where the church gets confused, because we think that if we just read the word of God, that that is faith that comes by hearing. But it is built by prayer, because what does prayer do? It helps us activate the word of God. But then how do we rule? By our words, by me declaring that I am the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath, that God will always work on the good of my behalf. By declaring the word of God, that is my rulership and my authority. What did the Roman centurion say to Jesus? Uh, Just give your word. All I need you to do is speak your word, and I know that my servant will be healed. We rule by our Words, But we have to build up to that level. We have to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have to understand the kingdom. We have to seek the kingdom so we understand the kingdom of heaven, so we understand the rulership and the authority that we have. So we're not like the goofy preachers of my day that got into like this weird name it, claim it stuff. They were like sewing watches and hoping that they would reap a Lamborghini. Like this is not the, (laughs) this isn't the kingdom of heaven. That sounds funny to you, but that's what I, (laughs) that's what I grew up in. I'm I'm showing my age because you guys are all looking at me like you're shocked. That was a very very real thing during that time. This is not the kingdom of heaven. This is not what we sow. We sow spiritual things. We sow prayer and fasting and God's word. We give without expecting anything in return, just knowing that as we seek the kingdom and intimacy and we make right decision, everything will be added unto us so we have no concern. See, you cannot you cannot overcome principle with prayer, right, Tyler? People are like, you really don't pray over your finances? I'm like, I really don't pray over my finances. I tithe because that's a principle, so I don't pray. Maybe I should. But I execute the principle, so I don't pray over that. And I pray a lot, but I don't pray over that because the kingdom is built on principle. Is everybody tracking with me? Romans 14, 17. Sorry. Isaiah 46.10, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times to what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. I make known the end from the beginning. The Holy Spirit knows the end of every decision that you're going to make before you make it, whether it is good or bad. Ladies, I'm going to tell you, I've told you two weeks in a row, be very careful before you enter that relationship. Gentlemen, You're a dude, so I don't really care. But ladies, be very careful before you enter that relationship. And it goes somewhere that you don't want it to go, and you are not married, but you are going through something that feels like a divorce. I don't know how many humans I have told told that to that are female between the ages of 18 and 23. And if you're dating a baseball player, whoa. (laughs) Like, it's good that I didn't know you, because I wouldn't have let that happen. No, I coached women's college soccer for years. And, like, I would see, like, whenever the girls would walk into the, my, my aerobic center, which is where I work with a baseball player, they would, like, avoid my office. I would sound like, I'm just, i got to go to the bathroom. Like, I'm, I'm tracking you. Baseball players are bad news. And so was I in college. All dudes are. All dudes are. Soccer players are bad dudes. They're, they're bad, too. Stay away from the soccer guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> Bruce, he's a heathen. Probably back there praying in tongues and interpreting it. (laughs) The Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. It knows the end from the beginning. Its kingdom is planted here through you. The kingdom is established through you in the unseen. Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. It's not doing things inside of this world. It is righteousness, making right decision, peace, which is cosmic order, divine order in your life. God wants to put everything, the kingdom of heaven is in order. God wants to put things in order because 
in the Old Testament, there was tapestry. It was always sin, exile, restoration, right? You're tracking with me. You're an Old Testament scholar, even though you're a baseball player, right? And it was always peace or divine order before God's glory. The tabernacle and the temple were put in order, and God didn't move in until the last piece of roof was put on. He said, make it according to plan. Put it in order. This is the kingdom of God. He wants your life to be in order. The kingdom of God is righteousness, making right decision, putting things in order. Put God first. Put your life in order. And a lot of things that you're dealing with right now, this is the best way to, to deal with sin. Trust me, if you are dealing with sin right now, okay? It's not to attack the sin. Because a lot of times we're dealing with sins of commission, things that we're committing because we are omitting things in the word of God. Seek intimacy, seek the kingdom of God, and the sin will simply fall off of you as you are running towards your destiny. Your history will quit jacking with you all the time. Everybody tracking with me? And joy in the Holy Spirit. So not only do you get to rank right decision and get everything in order, which comes before God's glory, but you get joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength. You get to take joy in the process, even though you can't see the result yet and you kind of worry sometimes and you kind of freak out. That's okay, as long as it does not distract you. Doubt, worry, the things of the world, they're going to attack. It's not that they're, they're not going to attack, but it's that you stand firm knowing that the result is up to God and you are not up to, the result's not up to you. Because if you believe that you're responsible for the result, you will strive and you will get anxious and you, you will create your own anxiety and your own mountains that you've got to deal with. Take back your dominion. If you function inside of this kingdom and you submit to it, you will have all the benefits of the king because that's the way kingdoms work. Is everybody tracking with me? All the benefits, all the authority, all the power, all the healing, all the freedom that you need, you will have inside of the kingdom. But you have to submit and seek the kingdom. Point number three, the Holy Spirit builds your faith. Jude 120 says this, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Spirit. This is controversial in the church today because there is a translation inside the Word of God where Paul said, uh, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but the Greek word means desire, and it was, it's very concrete. Paul said, I desire that you all pray in tongues. And then there's another place in the Word of God, where Paul said, some have different gifts. Some have the gift of speaking in tongues, but he used a different Greek word because there was an ability, a gift for people to be able to speak in a different language, a language that they did not speak, and a gift for people to be able to interpret it. Like there have been literally people praying in the Spirit in other countries, and they started praying out Spanish, but they didn't know Spanish, and they were really just praying out the oracles of God. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues, the Bible says this. It says, these signs will follow all those who believe, not some. Paul was not a trickster. He wasn't like, my desire is, is that you all pray in tongues, but you don't all have the ability. So <laughs> I do, you don't. Come on. God's not a schizophrenic. The power of praying in the Spirit allows you to see into the unseen. It builds you up on your most holy faith. It makes your faith whole. What is your faith? It's the evidence and substance of something that you cannot see. Everything that's lacking, everything that's broken, everything that's missing, the healing that you've had trouble receiving, that vision that you're having trouble getting from God. What, what am I called to do? What am I supposed to do with my life? Why does this thing keep attacking me? Why, why, well, you're talking about the attack, you're talking about the fruit. And we have to talk about the root if we're going to deal with the fruit. Everybody tracking with me? But the root you can't see. It's down under the ground. So we need the Holy Spirit to access the kingdom of heaven so he can give us wisdom on the thing that we cannot see so we can figure out what, where did that porn addiction come from? Where did that insecurity come from, ladies, that keeps getting you back into those relationships that you shouldn't be in? Where did that identity crisis stem from? But 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see the unseen. We can see the root of the issue, so we can deroot it, dig it up, and then the fruit just slowly begins to die out. Everybody tracking with me? How many times a sermon do I say, is everybody tracking with me, Colton? Leave me alone. The Apostle Paul said, I have prayed in tongues more than anybody alive. I have outprayed every man alive. I have outfasted every man alive. And I have not, I, I, I don't know what to say next, said Paul. But he was like, oh, and I've outdone every man alive. And then he kind of backed up and he was like, ah, I probably shouldn't have said that. And then he goes, but I'm speaking like a fool. But it wasn't I. It was the grace of God operating on the inside of me, God's empowerment. But just so you know, that empowerment, stop smiling, that empowerment came at a price because I have prayed in tongues more than all my brethren. I have outfasted all my brethren. I have sought the kingdom more than all my brethren. And I have brought the kingdom of heaven to earth more than all my brethren. So therefore I have outdone all my brethren. Because I have outprayed and I have outfasted every man alive. And as we fast, it breaks strongholds. So he, Paul's never thinking about him. He was broken. He died. There is increase in the decrease. That's the paradox of the kingdom. The prayer and the fasting simply destroyed him. It doesn't move God because God doesn't change. It moved God through him because God will always do it in you before he does it through you. The music team will come up. Faith is the evidence and the substance of something that you cannot see. When Paul was praying in tongues, he did not see his holy faith building up and becoming whole. He did not see his authority and his power increasing to a level that he was going to have dominion over all the power of the enemy. He, did, he couldn't see it tangibly. It happened in the intangible. It happened in the unseen world. But then he arrived at this place where he had the same power as heaven. Well, then he had to deal with it. Then he had to execute. So what did he do? He just heard from the Holy Spirit and wrote, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament while dominating Satan and the world and destroy, destroying idols everywhere he went. Everywhere he set foot. He gained ground for the kingdom of heaven and established the kingdom. He didn't just plant churches. He didn't just produce converts. He transferred his relationship with God because you can't transfer a weak relationship with God. He transferred Christ and salvation, but he transferred the kingdom of heaven. He transferred heaven's authority into other humans who then went and transferred God's authority and his power and dominion into other humans and what started with 12 people has now become over a billion humans the power the authority the dominion of god faith the evidence of things that we cannot see it was by faith that enoch was translated literally transitioned into heaven and did not taste death. You can't see that. You can't comprehend it. You can't understand it. It was by faith that Noah, being warned by God, built a boat and it wasn't even raining. It was by faith that Sarah believed whenever she was one million years old and barren that she was going to bore a son. And it was by faith that her husband took him to the top of a mountain to sacrifice him after he got promised that he was going to be the father of many nations. And then God told him to sacrifice the seed, the very thing that could make him the father of many nations. He could not see the result or how the result was going to come. All he could do was be faithful in the process. And now you have the Holy Spirit. 
It was by faith that Moses, when he came to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He had access to the world and to the kingdom and everything that was bad. He could have been, he could have been the prince, like the, like the richest little brattiest kid inside of the kingdom. Instead, he chose to suffer affliction with God's people and decrease. And what happened? He increased and became the most powerful man in the land. Everything he gave God, everything he sacrificed, God gave back to him by faith. He couldn't see it, but he just went in process. By faith, the Israelites passed through the Red Sea on dry land. They went from slaves to sons by faith. And they had difficulty seeing it because they had only known being slaves. And now they walk across this Red Sea where all their enemies were destroyed. And they look back and they're like, all my enemies are done. By faith, you have to believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross destroyed every one of your enemies. By faith, you have to believe that he accomplished what he set out to do on the cross. Even though you feel like your enemies are attacking you and are all over you and are coming at you all the time. Even though you can't see your deliverance and your freedom yet, it is coming. It is coming, my friend. It is coming. It was by faith that a group of humans walked around a wall for six days. And it was by faith that without a, any type of artillery or weapon, a fall fell down. And they leveled so deep that they couldn't find it until 3,500 years later. And the Israelites transitioned into Jericho and began to set foot towards their destiny. It was by faith. They couldn't see it. They couldn't see the spiritual army that was stirring up as they walked around that wall. And it began to stir and stir. And he said, do not talk. Because if you complain and you utter complaints, these words are powerful. Even though you can't see these, these words, the, the, your first generation of Israelites, they complained and they, they spoke these words into existence. And then they lived the reality of it and never fulfilled the call of God in their life because they complained and they remained in the very place that they complained. They couldn't see the words, but they spoke them into the air, and they accomplished everything that they were sent out to do. God, we don't trust you. I don't want to be here. I don't like your process. I have a better idea. I have a better way to do this. And they died in the desert. And the patriarchs, who through faith, through things they could not see, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, Obtain promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape by the edge of the sword, trusting in God. Became weak, but it made them strong. By faith, the evidence of something they could not see was making them strong and more powerful. They became valiant and fight. It's by faith that we believe this, that God is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. The Hebrew word for Rapha means to completely make whole, to thoroughly amend and repair. It's by faith that's an invisible God, the greatest physician on the earth. I told Sub 30 this a couple of weeks ago, and I think it's prevalent tonight. But Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. And he had a massive fall. And all the king's horsemen, and all the king's men, they couldn't put him back together again. But Jehovah Rapha, <laughs> your creator, can mend your heart, can take you back to the point where you fell apart, where that person said that thing that they shouldn't have said, that, that trauma that happened that God didn't intend to happen, but it happened. But your creator, the Holy Spirit, was there from the beginning. And the Holy Spirit knows your past and your present and your future. And by faith, we believe 
and a Holy Spirit that we can't see that can mend our heart and repair us and restore us and, and bring us completely back to our original state. By faith, we believe that the Holy Spirit was there whenever we were knitted together in our mother's womb, that he knows the beginning from the end and everything in between. He knows everything that has happened to you. He can bring you back to the point and make you whole again, just like Jesus intended. The Greek word for salvation, to make you whole, to mend you together. Full freedom, full deliverance, so that you can walk free, so you can live the kingdom of heaven, which is righteousness and peace and joy, not just making right decisions, not just having order, but having joy in the midst of the process, full freedom for your heart to be fully mended and put, that, put, put, put back together and restored to its original state.